When thinking about video game music, it might be easy to get carried away in the idea of the orchestral style scores we might expect to hear in Hollywood movies such as Spider-Man, Batman or Transformers. Whilst orchestral composers such as Harry Gregson Williams have had their hits, and misses, I find that the most memorable soundtracks are often written by those who have worked with the rest of the team to create something from the ground up which fits the tone and setting of the game. Legacy of Kane's Soul Reaver is a perfect example of this. The well-respected writer-director Amy Hennig, later responsible for Naughty Dog's Uncharted series, worked closely with the composers and sound designers Kurt Harland and Jim Hedges to make sure the game's music matched the ravaged world of Nosgoth. Soul Reaver was also one of the first 3D adventure games to use event triggers to subtly change the music on the fly, therefore augmenting its atmosphere and gameplay. Though Kurt Harland is a member of the surprisingly by the numbers new wave band Information Society, In 1997, their album Don't Be Afraid had taken a different turn and had a more industrial sound rather than electronic. Hennig's enlistment of Harland started with the composition Ozar Midrashim from this album. You might recognise it as the main theme of Soul Reaver and its motifs have been used in various tracks in every subsequent Legacy of Cain game. Jim Hedges was the audio programmer for Soul Reaver and worked with the game's code to create the triggers that could dynamically change the music. In an interview with the trio for the Interactive Audio Special Interest Group, Hedges explains this complex system. We used an in-house developed adaptive audio MIDI driver, which replaces the Sony driver entirely. Signals from the game based on location, proximity and game state set special music variables which are read by the driver and used to affect changes in the MIDI data. How these signals are interpreted is controlled by an extensive scripting language with standard branching, logic and arithmetic functions. This scripting language is written using MIDI text meta events. These text commands can be written in a standard text file or interspersed with other MIDI data in the MIDI by test stream. Some of the changes to the MIDI data available are muting, unmuting, transposition, pitch mapping, sequence start stop, volume, tempo, pan changes, etc. By analysing the instrumentation of the tracks, we find that they usually have around three states, neutral, combat and spectral realm. Neutral is the most sparse of the three, often laying down the percussive and rhythmic elements as a bass with minimal melody. Combat states often add more intense percussion and higher pitched stabs and melodies, maybe adding lower brass sounds too to fill the empty space in the bottom end. The spectral realm states are the most claustrophobic. They are a disjointed array of elements from the neutral and combat states, usually on top of a harmonically dense drone. These musical states often dictate the flow of the gameplay as you delve into the eerie spectral realm and then emerge again into the physical world. A cycle much like the Wheel of Souls the Elder God perpetually spins. There are some special musical triggers too, such as the encounters with Raziel's brothers which serve as the game's boss fights. One that sticks out in my mind is probably the fight with Duma, from which you can flee and return to later. Something to note about the tempo and rhythm of the percussion is that it seems to match Raziel's shuffling steps perfectly, perhaps unintentional, but I always felt this enhanced the feel of Raziel's movements, 
by again binding music and gameplay. Kurt Harland gathered inspiration from architectural drawings and lore based on the various vampire clans of Nosgoth. Amy Hennig described their backstory to Harland, and he did a fine job of matching his work to the various areas of the game. In the same interview as mentioned, Kurt Harland states, For any given area we took the history and nature of the creatures living there as the first inspiration for the soundtrack. For example, one of the regions in the game was inhabited by a race of mechanical engineering oriented vampires. Based on their goals and behaviours, and on the intended smoky mechanical environment in which they lived, I composed the sounds and music which were thick, slow and thumping, like big heavy machines far away. The Melkaim are often found among the tombstones of the necropolis. Their theme uses bone crunching sounds, and a melody played on an almost bone-like marimba. The Zephanim are a spider-like race who entomb their prey in cocoons. In their home, the Silence Cathedral, we hear spindly pizzicato strings, accompanied by high-pitched drones on the violin. The Drowned Abbey has the most intrusive and dissonant theme, which stands to reason. It is probably the most complex area of the game, and is one of the few areas where all of Raziel's abilities must be combined to find your way through it. Sometimes you must swim through long underwater tunnels to go further and deeper into the Abbey. Kurt Harlan's legacy shines through to the later games in the series, but this game seems to get it spot on in how the areas of the game feel so distinct. What the developers were unable to show graphically in regards to the habitat of the various vampire clans is made up wholly by its score, and in turn its shifting atmosphere. Although it's not my favourite soundtrack of the series, that probably goes to Soul Reaver 2, it is certainly the most important, and serves as an example to all composers who blindly follow the standard orchestral score aesthetic, without taking into consideration the deep lore a game can possess. In the advent of the leaked footage for the cancelled Legacy of Cain Dead Sun, it's really hard for me to understand just what was going through Climax Studio and Square Enix's minds. It is undeniable that they set out to copy many elements from the Batman Arkham games. They should have known better because Legacy of Kane has always been able to stand up in its own right as a unique and enjoyable experience. Square Enix should have also known better. As usual, it's crystal clear what the fans want from them, a conclusion to Kane's storyline. I am sceptical as to whether it can even be done without Amy Hennig's guidance. Legacy of Kane Dead Sun seemed visually and aesthetically pleasing, that's true, but I think what it really lacked was soul. Thank you for watching and if you enjoyed this video, subscribe for more.